Pathfinders and Wild Cards. Welcome to our Tuesday show. Uh, tonight is going to be fun. We're going to talk all about the Curse of the Crimson Throne and how to run it and what goodies uh, are in therein to find. And we're joined by Mike Barbo and Mike Dukes. So welcome, Mike's both Mike's two Mike's. <laughs> Mike off. So so so, uh, Mr. Dukes, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, Mike, check done. There we go. Uh, Mr. Barbo, how you doing? All right, if we disconnect, is it a mic drop? <laughs> right? I mean, yes, here we go. Mic drop. Boom. Done. Whoa. Mic drop. <laughs> oh, glorious. Now I got to move everybody else around. So it's the mic switch. So uh, welcome, guys. The um, So the reason we've got these um, duo mics tonight is Mr. Barbeau is the, um, the writer, converter, uh, line manager behind Pathfinder for Savage Worlds, which currently we have a Kickstarter going, uh, if you haven't noticed, guys. Um, it's going pretty awesome. I think we just passed 1,200 backers today, which is a number that we are very thankful for. And it looks like over 136,000 has been pledged, but that 1,200 number is fantastic. Um, so right on schedule for success. Uh, so congratulations on that, Mike. The, uh, if you guys haven't backed, there is a Kickstarter. I think I'll throw the link in there. Um, for you guys, it is Kickstarter, just, uh, Pathfinder of Savage Worlds, Curse of the Crimson Throne, and um, that's Hannibal. He's upset that he can't play it right now. The um, but for you guys, it's, it's the Curse of the Crimson Throne, six book long adventure path, the famous adventure path from Paizo, the second one they ever did, and it's the second one we're doing for Pathfinder for Savage Worlds, and uh, it's also the Advanced Players Guide. So we've done a stream last Tuesday on the Advanced Players Guide, so you can go check our YouTube catalog for the back uh, episode talking all about the Advanced Players Guide, but tonight it's going to be all about Curse of the Crimson Throne. And uh, Mr. Dukes uh, jumped the gun, um, or the dragon, so it was, so it is. Um, and after he got his, his uh, little Game Master fingers on Pathfinder for Savage Worlds, and Rise of the Rune Lords, he decided to just run his game group through Curse of the Crimson Throne before he even knew we were converting it. Um, so we're going to talk about his campaign, which he has been um, running and publishing online. So that is the uh, the goodness for this evening. And um, let me see. Uh, first, I'm going to give you guys... Let's see, where is the regular comment? So the first comment I'm going to post in is the, the link to the Kickstarter. If you haven't seen it, it is fantastic. And uh, we've got, uh, well, let's see, a week and two days more on that, nine more days. And um, other than that, guys, uh, shoot your questions into the chat and we'll um, bring them up. The, uh, uh-oh, uh-oh, Dark Dad's back. The, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so him, when him and John Dukes get together, there's, there's going to be trouble. It's good that we don't give you guys Benny's influence the interview, but the... Um... Uh, so yeah, John Doom brings up actually a really great question. I think this is where we'll start. We'll start with Mr. Dukes. Dukes says, I love how you're doing the talking heads during your campaign, by the way. And uh, Mr. Dukes was kind enough to um, throw in some samples of his streams. So I'm going to play those now. So it's really great. It's kind of like you know, those, those either mockumentaries or documentaries where you, you do actually do the actual play, but you pull characters aside to do their thing. So um, we'll do two little clips to start with before... Um, uh, we get on with the rest of the questioning, but here, here's one about your talent, not respecting each other's talent, which is kind of funny, so. Uh, Good job. I didn't get my nose right. Yeah, plus this person looks like they're talented. Uh, he doesn't seem to appreciate my art, uh, my performances, and um, so I just don't really appreciate him. <laughs> so, Mike, before we show the second, Bravo. right? Right? <laughs> Before we show the second clip, introduce us to who your players are that we that are uh, in your campaign. Okay, uh, so we have a half orc fighter that is Todd Jordan. I believe they're in the he's the lower right hand corner, and then next to him is his wife Amber. She plays a gnome rogue, who is you would not think it. You would think the big half orc fighter would be the damage dealer, the killer. No, 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 no. His wife, the little gnome, she is the murderer. And then, uh, did you what, what 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 class is she playing? Because I know some certain gnome artificers and their potions that she's a rogue. Kill. Oh, nice. Okay, straight, straight up, rogue. up rogue. So yeah, when she finds the advanced players guide, then um, lots of even more trouble because you know napalm and um, yeah. Right, so we got to continue. Who else is in the in the stream? Oh, um, we just heard from Kaylee. She plays Margot, our halfling bard. And then lastly, we have Sean Hilton, who is playing our halfling cleric, Gavin. So yeah. it's kind of an odd a little mixture, two halflings, a gnome, and a big half-orc. 
Does your uh, does your bard tend to support the rogue so uh, she gets sneak attacks and a lot? There is so many. The support rules are just nuts because they just don't end. I'm going to support him on that. I'm going to work the room. And it's just like <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And then, of course, the cleric is always casting smite on the fighter and the rogue. It's pretty deadly. They've got a running total. I think the the record right now is 43 damage. Oosh. That's pretty good. I think that's up there near where my all-time like high record of damage in Savage Worlds is. So that's, that's a pretty good number. And I mean, and, and, and Mr. Dukes brings up a good point for Mr. Barbeau is that the, I mean, kind of the reason that we were so pleased to be able to bring Savage Worlds rules to the Galarian world. Um, it's not because we don't like 3.5 or 5e or Pathfinder at all. It's because there's just certain things that we've come to love about Savage Worlds, like those support rules, right? I mean, those just really aren't, there's no equivalent in the other systems for how those things go down. So, uh, Mr. Barbeau, you want to talk a little bit about how you kind of, the, the, the design theory on how to bring Savage Worlds crunch to Galarian and in particular the Curse of the Crimson Throne. So, uh, you know, it's a big thing to be able to be uh, a key player when you're not just murdering somebody. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really hard uh, in some games, right? Because you get into a fight, uh, everybody starts rolling their dice, throwing things out there, and as people fall, uh, it becomes hard to uh, shine if you're the support guy, right? And some people get a kick out of it. I, I have friends who love playing support roles. Anytime somebody drops an enemy, they're like, you know what, that two extra damage, that was my damage, right? And if you enjoy that, it works out great. Um, but when you're looking at uh, Curse of the Crimson Throne, by the way, spoiler alert for anybody, I'm going to try and be kind of vague, but uh, there is inevitable spoilers here. Uh, when you look at some of the events here, um, there's an instance in which you need to meet up with a uh, king uh, self-proclaimed king. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of ways to go about doing it. Um, you could uh, carve your way in. Uh, one of the things I wanted to make sure to introduce as an option there is uh, there's, for example, I put in a uh, social conflict, right? Uh, and so you can try to earn your way in past these guards. Uh, you know, maybe it works out well for you, maybe it doesn't. Um, but throughout the whole uh, campaign, uh, there's a lot of instances where uh, if you take like work the room or if you, you know, or even just playing a really social character, uh, the people that you can influence and the uh, dynamics you can change in a, in a fight. Uh, a thing I think back on with Rise of the Rune Lord, so I guess Rise, spoiler alert. Um, there's they've had time to play now. now right. We, right, right. They've, they've had their books for at least a week and they've had the PDS for like months, so... In the first book, there's a, uh, a guy uh, that's working as a mercenary uh, for the big bad in the end of book one. And if you come across him and you try appealing to him, you can actually convert him over to your side. And there's a lot of things like that in this book in where uh, you have to like win over people or uh, there's certain ways you can take advantage of different encounters. Um, <laughs> Agro muffin, I like that. Right, right. Yeah, agro muffin is a new, it's that's that's going in the dictionary. Agro muffin, it's yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I have a I have a group where uh, my group loves action cards or the adventure cards, um, mm -hmm. and so like I think the the big one is that uh, double all support bonuses for a round. Uh, if that one gets played, like people just go crazy, uh, and all of a sudden one person's just like ready to go through the roof. So yeah. Yeah, so I mean, since 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 you 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 jump the wizard or whatever the the new thing is, there are well, I mean, technically there aren't guns in Pathfinder yet because we haven't done the gunslinger yet. Um, <laughs> but Mr. Dukes, how hard was it to convert you know uh, Curse of the Crimson Throne just using the basic uh, Pathfinder for Savage Worlds book? So what was easy about it and what was difficult about it for 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 the folks who just can't wait for us to get to their favorite adventure path? I mean, I've converted. D&D games in the past anyway, if you've got a strong enough handle on Savage Worlds and a pretty decent handle on whatever game you're converting from, it's not that hard. But the caveat there is you're only doing it for your home group, or in my case, two groups, whereas Mike is having to do it for all the groups. 
my groups, I don't have to worry about them going through the rules going, hey, wait, that's not right. That's overpowered. They don't care. They're in the moment. It's not a big deal. I feel for Mike, though, because having to test this stuff over because we were talking. We we're basically on the same page, actually, on a lot of stuff. But, man, I, I, I feel for him. But as far as difficulty, it's it's not really that bad. The hardest thing for me was I really had no Pathfinder experience. I've been a player in a few games, and that was it. So there were some things, the big one for me, uh, the Hell Knights. Didn't know what a Hell Knight was. So I was just going by, okay, he's got this. Sure. So during the chase, when the PCs are trying to find the killer of the king, one of the chase cards came up, some reinforcements or something come in, an, an alternate uh, group. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to use some Hell Knights. I'll throw three of them in there. Decimated. So I had to go look up Hell Knights. Okay, what are Hell Knights? Huh. And then around, I don't know, a few weeks later, we get the companion book. I can see what the armor and everything does. Oh, crap. And then there's uh, some Pathfinder comic books. So I think the last couple dealt with the Hell Knights exclusively around Corvosa. Then I got the full picture. So I had to keep bumping the Hell Knights up a little bit. So the first time was, oh, those were new units. They, they were new guys, newbies. They, it didn't matter. Did not matter. I got high ranking guys and they're still just decimating. And I got to the point where they're laughing at him, mocking the Hell Knights. So when the Hell Knights left Corvosa because of what was happening, as far as they were concerned, it's because of them. <laughs> Which let them have it, right? Sure. Yeah. I, I will say one of the big things, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, in converting, you know, you ran into this, you have to read in advance. Like, we have all been GMs in a game where we've, like, had stuff come up. And last minute, all right, guys, I got to read this room. I didn't get to it. Uh, I think you can attest there is so much in here, you know, that interconnects. Uh, there's a point where it's like, hey, if your crew didn't do this back in book three, you can choose to have them do it now because it's a good time to do an interlude um, and things like that. So there's, it's good to read ahead because there's a lot involved uh, and there's a lot of just key antagonists and allies that uh, interact with you. And if you're, you end up going room by room too often, uh, you know, you get to a point, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. And then you get three rooms later, based on whichever direction your party went, you're like, oh, I was supposed to do that. Uh, <laughs> that was the other reason why I went with, because I'm running this game twice. I've got my home group. They're my guinea pigs. So I can see what happens with them. If something works, something doesn't work. Then when the video group, when I do them, I've got a better grasp of what happens. Unfortunately, schedules get crossed and the video group got ahead of the home group and then yeah well and that, that is the hardest part about being adult and playing rpgs right it's it's not it's not the modules that kill you it's finding the time where everybody can actually consistently meet for long enough to go through a campaign so the um so for those of you who haven't yet watched um like to campaign and want all the spoilerific fun that it's, it's had here is the link uh, to the channel um what's the name let's see let me let's pull this up and we'll get the name of your channel so they can google it as well the um vorpal edge productions vorpal edge productions okay so the uh, there's the link or you can google vorpal edge productions and um how far have you guys gotten so far the uh i mean it's a six book campaign so in the in in the actual actual play video that, that's been published how far like which book are you guys on and how far have you gotten i mean actually where we're currently at we're about to enter book four as far as the videos, I believe it's still book one. So uh, book four, which of your players do you think is going to end up uh, having their character get down into their skivvies? I'm hoping the half orc. <laughs> but I also thought that was going to happen earlier. They were fighting some uh, rat people. And they had convinced, my group is, they're big talkers. If they can talk their way out of something, they will. So instead of going in and massacring these rat people in the sewers, they talked to them, aced their persuasion role, and said, hey. And now they're friends. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> Only, you know, they weren't going to be that friendly. So they're like, all right, here. You will choose the champion, and you will fight Geerigs. And if you win, we're good. If you lose, you die. And <laughs> instead of choosing a half-orc for this battle, they chose the gnome rogue. 
six foot, seven foot tall half orc, D twelve strength, and instead they choose the. So, so is this is this mandatory on dressing part of the Shawanti like negotiation? Is that what you're talking about, Mike? Or is there something uh, yeah. or some other reason no, no, that you no, have it, to ditch your class? That. And yeah. uh, it is, uh, I, I really do want to see them try to uh, negotiate with Cinder Ma. We'll have to yeah. tell them somebody tries that. Uh, <laughs> is, is, is that the, the like the, the worm that's connected to the fire? Like, uh, to, yeah, he's like fused with the elemental plane of fire. It's, yeah. uh, it's pretty gnarly. Um, it's, it's kind of like Dune meets Jonah. So, Here's here's what I love about the Pathfinder modules. You have where rats who have this really weird like uh, social conflict going in within their ranks, and you know some people are against others based on like their beliefs and about like their social status in society, and then you just have a giant worm fused with a strange plane of fire, right? Like they like to ride both of those <laughs> levels, uh, and it's fantastic. The uh... Right, I mean that that, that 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 is why we want we want to play Savage Worlds because it's very Savage Worlds, right? You could you there's tongue and cheek elements. There's very I mean this is actually a very serious adventure path, which I like watching um, Mr. Dukes' as AP because they're very humorous a lot of times. It kind of takes a lot of the sting. You, you can play this straight up. I mean, it is political intrigue and plagues and and um, the uh, yeah yes. And I, I mean, knowing Clint, I don't think I'd want to fight his gnome. The um, no, no. I don't remember who told me it, but it's uh, every RPG. Uh, your theme is humor plus whatever the party adds. Um, if you go for serious, it's it's humor plus serious. If you go for horror, it's humor plus horror. Uh, and you know what? We're all there to have fun, but that's that's what it comes to. Right. I had a lot of fun. Just there is a lot of humor, and because of that, and they kind of I think have gotten to expect that. I love just flipping that completely on them. There's only been a couple of times I've actually shed tears as an NPC, and I did both times was in this game. So, okay, for instance. Oh, oh, oh no, no, I've got a for instance because you, oh. you, 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 you sent me the clip. So here's a clip, so a little preview. So this is supposed to be a somber moment when the party is dealing with, like, <laughs> the spouse and her husband is dead on the floor, like, right in front of them. And... Um, uh, Mr. Dukes decides to, to add a little levity. I mean, the, 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 the part, so the preview to this, uh, I, I cut it a little shorter, but you know, the characters are all worried about like, oh gosh, we really shouldn't like insult this woman. How do we ask for what we need to get out of her without like disrespecting the fact that her husband's still warm but dead on the floor? And um, this is Mr. Dukes' portrayal of the uh, grieving um, widow. So let's, let me pull this up because this is hilarious. Uh, here we go. Why don't you uh, lay Elgin's remains back in this? Excuse me, do you have any rope? I'm so sorry to bother you. Especially, you know, you're probably grieving. I'm so we are too. We're just, you know, trying to My husband at these last 30 years he fell over death right in his stew, spilled everywhere. It smelled horrible. And then the damn cat kept lapping it up, but I was screaming. I, I told him, you get away from him, you little she-devil. Meow, he said, meow. I just want my husband back. Why have the gods forsaken me? What am I to do? I can't walk. Look at these hands. I, what am I to do? I was a washerwoman, and now all those years of washing and washing for so, other people. So, and they didn't so give sorry, me anything. No, they gave me nothing. I washed and I washed and yeah. I washed. And what do I have? No. I want a dead husband that and a freaking devil cat. Yeah. I hate cats. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. Right there with you, I'm, buddy. I'm sorry, dearie. I'm sorry. I, no, I was. Oh, you sorry, want this, you know? I. <laughs> okay. So. so I'm right there with you, buddy. Is the, <laughs> it kills me at the end. <laughs> I, I just love it. It's so somber leading up to this. And like, you you need some rope. I mean, it's kind of like a boon, uh, was it boondock saints. You know, you, you need some rope. Whenever you ever use the rope, but you got to ask this lady you know, for some rope. And and it turns out, yeah, she's more worried about the smell on the cat than the fact that, you know, yeah, husband being dead. Nah, nah, nah. The, the cat, the cat's the problem. Uh <laughs> So, yes, this is a very serious actual play, people. I mean, you know. <laughs> it has its just, moments. The, the, yes, the, 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 the solemnity is really, really authentic. But I'm right there with you. So, yeah, so Mr. Dukes, tell us about other times that, you know, that, that you, you, you've you brought the humor or whatever other, you know, random. The, um, uh, okay, like I was mentioning, there's 
uh, I can't remember what book it is, book three, when you're dealing with a certain emperor. And there are listings in the book that just give you brief descriptions of encounters. And there's one, there's this baker, he's in his nightshirt and nothing else. He's on his balcony. He's just ranting at anyone and anything. There's no one on the street. He doesn't care. He's just ranting about what's going on. Well, again, this group loves to talk. So instead of just bypassing him, ignoring him, they converse with him. They go in his house. They're, hey, what's going on? And he's complaining about all the things that have occurred. And then because they're befriending him, he tells them, I can't wait for you to meet my wife, but she's asleep right now. And right then, all of them, you can see the looks on their faces because they realize there's a plague going on. They kind of know, wait, asleep? So the cleric sneaks down into the bedroom to look, and sure enough, she's dead. So a day passes, and this guy, it's obvious, he's just not altogether there. He's not handling this death well. So the cleric asked me, is there any way I can cast heal to fix his mind, make it so he's back whole? So I thought, okay, this will be a good opportunity, because they're all kind of joking around about this guy. So I gave him a modifier, told him to roll. He rolled well. So I described it as he could see in his mind, this guy's mind was like a fractured crystal. And he was having to slowly push the pieces back where they're supposed to be. And as that was happening, I had this guy who was ranting and raving suddenly start sobbing, admitting she's gone, she's dead. And I had tears in my eyes and then they started falling down on the table and just the looks on all their faces because it went from ha ha to oh my God. And it just kind of brought it all home for him. So we have a lot of fun, but there are just some very serious moments from time to time. Yeah, yeah I, I, the, I think uh, that's the best of role playing is, is the roller coaster, right? You get the highs and the lows, the you know, the, the, the serious uh, and touching and the, the humorous. So before before Mike comments, uh, the other Mike, I mean, this is this was clearly a mistake, right? <laughs> the uh, letting two mics on one stream, don't cross the mics. But the um, fast zombies or slow zombies. Faster are always more fun. Is that, is that how you wrote it, Mike, Mr. Barbeau? Did you write fast zombies or slow zombies? Oh, yeah, no, no. They're 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 fast. They'll keep okay. up with you. Nice. Okay, you can carry on to your comment now, now that I, we, we, we've answered fast or slow zombies, as that's really the important part. I don't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, of course. Oh, I do now, yeah. Um, so to talk about moods, I think book two opens with a dying girl, right? Like, uh, it's... It's one of those things where um, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. Uh, and this is, you know, we, we follow really close to the module. Uh, but as you said, you know, we're, we're trying to keep it for, for everybody. And so there's a lot you can add into your own group. Uh, there's a, a drunken soldier who's kind of fallen out of it um, that you meet in book one who, who has additional appearances if you want, if you work for it. Uh, you know, you can just fight him or leave him be to, you know, drink himself to death, or you can help him. Uh, when I, one of the times I ran it, one of my players uh, wanted to be from the city, and he was like, oh, I feel for this guy, and he, like, connected to him, and he was like, oh, like, am I, like, related to this guy at all, maybe? And so I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. He's like your your uncle. Uh, and so then, like, you know, he built this, this more personal interaction with them. Uh, and then, of course, later on in book two, when, when everything starts coming back, he's even more invested uh, when Grouse shows back up. And so, uh, I mean, from back when they did Shackled City, uh, which was back when they were uh, doing three, five modules, it's another one of their, their thick books, um, they did an amazing job of making, you know, like I said, the more you put in, the more you get out of it. And, and that's the kind of interaction uh, that really pulls. Um, you know, Blackjack, for example, uh, for anybody who, who doesn't know, uh, Blackjack is the local folk hero of uh, Corvosa, right? He's uh, uh, Zorro, I think is the best comparison. Um, definitely not Batman because he's too good of a guy. Uh, but there's a lot to deal with, like finding out who, who he is and how do you interact with him and how does that affect your characters, um, you know, Mike commented on the other Mike, 
uh, <laughs> I'm not suddenly speaking in third person. I commented about how uh, at one point there's a chase, which uh, I don't know, it sounded like you used the chase deck. Of course, you know, we made sure that was in there. Um, but you can handle that whole situation like two different ways, and maybe more, right? You know, you can uh, believe, you can disbelieve, you can help one group or help another. Like there's, there's a lot of different uh, groups pulling and buying for uh, power throughout the story. And uh, I mean, some grow and some wane, but uh, uh, there's a lot of different ways for parties to tackle it. And so we have like the meat and bones, we have the uh, encounters built up. Um, you know, as Mike said, he he ran, you know, probably the standard like three or four Hell Knights uh, and they got taken down like really quick. And so you run into, you know, I talked about, I think two, two streams ago, the difference between uh, fantasy games and uh, uh, no armor, like shooting games in which, you know, parry and toughness and whatnot come up. And, you know, it, it goes both way. You know, sometimes you're hard to hit and sometimes you hit like a freight train. Uh, and so you got to, you know, adjust in a certain way. Uh, we did that in um, Rise of the Rune Lords by making sure there was uh, extra wild cards. Because uh, one of the issues you run into, if you got three guys with a D8, you know, half the time they're not hitting anybody with their attacks, right? And so you need that extra person to throw out his bennies to to re-roll his attacks and, and there's just a lot that goes into it um and there's there's a, a bit more that comes with all the humans here uh you've got you know you've got drug dealers you've got the town guard you've got cutthroats you've got bandits uh you know you've got everything from the wimpy noble uh to the necromantic serial killer uh and so uh, you know, it's one thing when you're throwing out monsters and it's like, here's all the make-believe buffs that they have. Uh, and it's something else when, you know, you're looking at somebody and it's like, all right, he's a human and he's in full play. All right, maybe he's got trademark weapon and block and we're going to throw in formation fighter and we're going to throw in, you know, this other thing. And you have to build it in such a way that it becomes harder I think Mike and I talked back and forth a couple times about different uh, uh, Grey Maidens um, until I shared uh, the the new edge for the book in which you know you can do defense and then buff your your allies. Uh, and one of the things is uh, making the Grey Maidens be more powerful because you don't walk down the city street and see forty dudes charging you, right? Uh, you know, you walk down, you get encountered by four, you know, maybe six. Uh, maybe somebody sneaks around the corner, but those those humans, those people need to do a lot more. Uh, and so you kind of have to focus on utilizing the uh, Savage Worlds mechanics, right? Like it's it's a big thing to test, right? Make players vulnerable or make your enemies vulnerable, depending on how things are going. Um, you know, Mike here, you know, we talked about how big the Hell Knights got taken down. And uh, sure enough, you know, <laughs> you you wait and all of a sudden somebody else is playing and they're like, all right, I'm going to throw in like three more bad guys because I heard they were real easy. And your players like crit fail three times and the bad guy aces uh, and you made the mistake of rolling in the open this one time and do 80 damage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, new character. It, it, it happens. It's, it's rough. <laughs> Um, so one of my favorite questions from like the, the author stream with James Jacobs, and I think Mike's the one who submitted it, was there there are certain characters, bad guys and women, um, in the game that are redeemable in this campaign. And um, it, it kind of depends on how your groups work with them or whatever. Um, so Mr. Dukes, I'll start with you, but then Mr. Barbeau. Um, did you have any instances where your groups made the choice of, you know, bringing someone back from the brink uh, and converting them over to the good guys? Actually, yes. Uh, Mike mentioned Growl Soldado. He's the drunkard guard. I was impressed. Both groups, the clerics, chose to use Remove Poison because this guy was, you know, completely drunk, deep in his cups. Use Remove Poison to draw that alcohol out of his system and set him back on the right path. Smart, and smart. Then, uh, Good way to detox. And then all the world's meets, the guy there was kind of led into it by his girlfriend. <laughs> I was fully expecting they were just going to put him to the blade and be done with it or just take him 
to the Citadel, have them hung or whatever. And instead, they actually wanted to know why you were letting these guys kill people and serve it. And he, when he, once he told them, you know, I didn't know that. That's not why I was doing this. And it all came out. So eventually, they didn't even put handcuffs or manacles on him. They just let him walk with his armor and his weapons so that no one would realize, looking at him, that he had fallen so low. They just escorted him back to the Citadel and uh, took it from there. I was, like I said, fully expecting him to die. And instead, they pulled that. That's fantastic. And so, Mr. Barbosa, this was your question. The um, any, any particular characters you think players should attempt to save? Like ones that you're like, yeah, yeah um, give, them, give them a shot. Give them a shot. So first of all, I, I got to say, I don't think I've had a group that did not murder him. So <laughs> it warms my heart to hear the different ways, like different people handle things. Um, so this is, a, I, I said it before, but this is a big spoiler uh, for something. So uh, earmuffs, if you really don't want to know. Um, there is a follower uh, for a serial killer. Um, and she is in this house and she has this beautifully set up macabre encounter uh, where there's like zombies all over. Um, and if you read the book ahead of time, like they trigger in different rooms as you're like tracing her and she goes invisible and she has smoke bombs and she's all this other stuff, but she's crazy, like, like legitimately crazy. And she's been groomed by this serial killer. And so she's just so overly devoted to him. Um, and so one of the times I ran it very similar uh, to, you know, what Mike was saying about people taking pity is, you know, one of the players is like, you know, he, he was uh, a lawyer. And so he like, he's like, I want to roll for this. I, you know, he diagnosed her as, uh, you know, actually having a, a disorder. And he's like, we can't just kill her. We have to help her. And so they went through all of this extra effort to get her into like a rehabilitation place and like get her help. And then, uh, you know, to reward them later, they were in this like really rough fight. Uh, and I had her just like appear out of the shadows and like attack a guy. And she like gives this crazy quip, you know, because she's still a little off. Um, but like she became a fan favorite for the group because she was just, she was funny, she was lethal. And, uh, you know, they just, they felt really good for taking somebody who might have just been assumed to be, you know, just really evil and they fixed her. And so that is probably my favorite redemption in the book. But it's far from the only person that you can bring back or bring to your side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. The um, <laughs> we're not listening. I see. I love it. Like I, I don't mind spoilers because I'm, I, I think uh, you know, on the if you, if you have good players, players know how to separate player knowledge from character knowledge. So certain little spoilers really don't matter as much as um, you know. It, it, you know, if, if you have people who just can't. They can't. They can't make the divide. There's no wall between their character and, the, and then their player knowledge. Death the, before that uh, again, right? <laughs> <laughs> the um, so uh, so this is a six book adventure path, which is I mean, kind of what what, what, what Pies has become famous for. Have you guys ever noticed in running any of Pies, or you know, especially Crimson, um, uh, differences between the books? I mean, uh, you know, they're, they're they're apparently spearheaded by a different author. As the, like the primary lead on each each adventure book, um, if you, you guys sense the difference in tone or in how it runs, or do you have you, you know found certain favorites that you've associated with a certain author, or um, or what? So most of these were also put out individually as uh, each you know each book was one at a time before they did the compilation. I think the biggest shift, uh, and if Mike, if you've converted this already, you'll know what I'm talking about, is book five. Uh, it's the skeletons of Scarwall. Yeah. Um, that, uh, it's, it's one of the few books where, uh, if your players aren't as interested, it doesn't like, you know, make everything, uh, hinge on every aspect of it. You can, uh, shorten it. There's little tips in the back for how to shorten the dungeon crawl. So then go in, get what they need, come out and, and be heroes. Uh, but it is a true dungeon crawl. Like the uh, the castle itself is cursed. Uh, one of the things I love about it, though, is there's all these uh, events that happen that kind of give you uh, visions or feelings of like the the horrors that have happened uh, back when it was run by uh, the the original uh, Blue Dragon uh, killer uh, and 
from later when it got taken over by the, the evil spirit. And so there, I mean, like it's dangerous to sleep there. You can't get in and out easily. Uh, there's undead that reform if you don't properly deal with them. Um, and so, you know, you, you, your players may not know, they move on and uh, all of a sudden they run into this guy in a new room and they're like, I thought we killed him. And then somebody <laughs> probably goes, yeah, we definitely killed him. Are you sure he's in this room? And you go, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, isn't that the best part about having a serial killer who's a necromancer? It's like, I kill people, but I bring them back. <laughs> so, really, is everything, you know, like, is it really that bad? But yeah, so so book five is just drastically different in its tone, how it's run. Um, and I like that a bit because it's a, it's a change. It lets your players experience something a bit different. Um, yeah, yeah, salt and burn the bones for sure. Uh, but yeah, it's, I think it's a change. You can tell, uh, you know, that a different look was taken while while writing it. But overall, I think it adds to the to the module. Uh, so yeah, you, Mr. Dukes, have you noticed any um, any differences between the books, or have a, have a certain favorite book so far that you've run through? Or I learned, uh, especially with our video group. Again, they love to talk. If you strip that away from them, they don't know what to do. So any kind, anytime there's been any kind of dungeon crawl esque event, things have not gone well. The uh, the vilified labyrinth and book three is rough, and it just got to be a slog. So I realized, okay, this is not not working. So I had to speed things up and mike's right i could easily see book five i'm glad there are tips in there that let you know hey if you want to speed things up just do this skip this but yeah i have noticed in uh adventure paths in general because originally i was not going to run curse of the crimson throne i'm a huge ravenloft horror fan i was going to run carrion crown so i read that first book loved it got to the second book and it seemed like a completely different thing Thankfully, Curse doesn't really have that, other than the dungeon crawly elements, which even that we've had fun with. You know, one thing I think they do uh, in those that help is uh, you are given uh, NPCs not to fight the fights for you, but as uh, sounding boards. Like they, they have their own agenda, they're there for their own reason. Um, and so while you're, you're isolated, in this thing, you can, you know, kind of fall back on those two for interactions and you can fall back on the the visions, the phantasms and the haunts and things like that. Um, because yeah, I, I, I think every group is a little bit social uh, in the way I like to do things. I definitely have a group that's all about the dungeon crawl, right? They will, uh, they will seal team six through a dungeon, <laughs> right? They're like, all right, we're all ready in action. I want this side door, he's on that side. Get the um, corners, get the corners. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, and they love that, right? And you go for it, right? You know, we, we put more time into that kind of thing. Uh, and then you have the people who are just like, uh, uh, you know, they, I mean, they want to watch the world burn, so they're all for whatever's going to cause the most chaos. <laughs> uh, and then you have the social people. And it's always fun watching the chaos and the social uh, debate to see who gets to interact with the PNPC. <laughs> are we going to talk to him or are we going to shoot him in the face first? You know, magic missile, magic missile. My, my group calls it shooting into diplomacy. Because uh, <laughs> that has literally happened before. The other so thing I would say is book four. It seems like you're getting extras to go with your group now. You're getting some of those Shuante, I can't remember their exact name. It's not the Thunder Callers. Uh, Bone something. Bone something. Yeah. But essentially, yeah, you're being given extras to go along with you, and that seems to happen after that as well. So I'm curious how my group's going to handle that because they've never, we've got a lot of NPCs, but they've never had to control them or do anything with them. Yeah, and and the the book I think is really good. They you know make it obvious that they're not there to to fight the fights for the players. They're there for their own purpose. Um, and you know I, I think I've said this before, but for me, a lot of the joy in running a game is the the extras that you run into or in playing a game, right? Like we all interact with the party all the time. 
And when you get to that town and you get to, you know, run into the contacts you built up, uh, you know, through networking, whatever it is you're doing, that's what really pulls me into the story more. Uh, whether it's, uh, you know, Elder Scrolls or an RPG, right? You know, I, I, I get pulled into the people that you're interacting with. So speaking of letting the world burn, and this is uh, kind of coming off of the interview with James Jacobs. So there's there's kind of a, 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 a microcosm part of this um, story um, that is Paizo realizing on, you know, we have to do a dragon. We need dragons. It was you know, D&D at the time when they're doing 3-5, right? It's like dragons are D&D's bread and butter, right? It's like right there in the logo. It's in the name. And Paizo's like, eh, we haven't really done a dragon yet. And um, and this isn't a dragon. We haven't spoiled this image yet, I don't think. Maybe during the stream. But certainly not in the advertisement. There's like, there's the big red dragon next to the queen. But not that dragon. There's another kind of really cool reveal with a dragon. And um, I don't know if Mike's far along. I'm not going to remember which book it's in. But the have your, play, have your players kind of done that mission with the, the surprise dragon? Not yet. And actually, okay, that so, yeah. kind of threw me as well. That was one of those things where I would say, yeah, that's a little different from everything they've experienced thus far. Because that caught me by surprise. Like, wait, there's no mention of this anywhere. Right? Surprise! Do you do <laughs> now, I bet you guys didn't buy enough supplies last time you were in town. <laughs> because, like, if you're going dragon hunting, you know, right? Like, you're going to you're gonna stock up. But this one wasn't, well, yeah, it's not so, not so obvious. So you're going to run more into that one, so... So, I agree. Surprise dragons are the best kind of dragon. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like the opposite of birthday parties. Surprise birthday parties are not the best birthday parties, but it's uh, uh, it's things like that where uh, my group, uh, the one where I'm actually getting to play right now, uh, we came across like our first magic item, uh, and we're like we're really excited, right? Maybe it's damaging, you know, who knows what it is. Uh, and we're like, well, maybe we'll just sell it. That way we can get the money uh, because we want to open a tavern. Because, um, you know. As just you because. do. We want to go uh, in the covers. <laughs> like, we don't want to go adventuring. We want to retire and have a stable, steady, stable well, income. Adventure and own a tavern. Um, but it turns out it's uh, brutal, right? So it lets you do uh, heavy damage. And it's like, well, that's not getting sold anytime soon. That's going in the backpack for a rainy day. Uh, because, you know, we're going to sell it and then we're going to need it. Um, so, yeah, like surprise monsters like that, I just love. So what was it like designing the, the dragons for, 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 for like Pathfinder for Savage Worlds? Because we didn't, we didn't have them in Rise of the Rune Lords, but now we got them now. So me or me or Mike? No, you, you, Barbo. <laughs> But Mr. Dukes, had, Mr. Dukes, he hasn't had his characters up against. I haven't got there yet. So, so he might uh, actually get the PDFs in time. So you'll, you'll be playing your. There's a couple of the different. Series. There's a couple different dragons. Uh, the most notable one, you will hopefully never fight because you don't lose the campaign. Um, like literally, the only reason you should fight him is because you lost. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you know, try hard. Uh, no, but. There's there's a lot that goes into it. We have a good uh, default for um, the the core bestiary, right? We have all those, and so that's always used as the groundwork uh, for whenever we're, we're switching these over. Uh, however, um, Paizo doesn't just go with uh, a default dragon every time. Um, <laughs> there we go. The tavern is a mimic. You don't even know. <laughs> um, but they, they do something unique. Uh, I can't, Mimic, by the way, is one of my favorite monsters, so you guys are really distracting me. Uh, <laughs> have, wait, have you statted one yet? I mean, like, let's divigate here. Have you done a yeah, Mimic in Savage Worlds? I, I, that's, a, that's a rabbit hole I want to go down. Okay, but, uh, okay, fine, fine. Next stream, next the stream. Dragons, the dragons are all unique in their own way. Like, a, a lot of, the, there are always a basic thing that you can run into. Um, but you're also going to run into the dragon that's used as a mount that has, you know, extra special abilities for that, or a dragon that's been uh, alive a lot longer, and so it's got these extra abilities. Um, some that take classes, uh, and you know, classy you, dragons. They lift their right. That's what you, need. you need your dragon with martial flexibility. Um, <laughs> so what what I try to do is I try to stick with, you know, what we did first. Right, we we take the core over, uh, and then grasp the intention of whatever they had, 
sorry, I mute my phone, uh, and then pull over whatever edges are needed in order to make that work. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's, man, I don't, I don't want to get into too many surprise dragons, so I'm just going to okay. leave it at that. Uh, okay. I'll let people be entertained by their own surprise dragons. Well, and here's the price. So, I mean, Mike's in over a bunch of clips. I do want to get one more before we got to go. The um, not a dragon, but almost killed the party because apparently this was like a Hell Knight's horse. Um, that's a clip we're doing. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I got to show this one. So, here's another clip for you guys. Seven. Okay. As this thing, you leap up, it's death throws. It kind of kicks out a couple of times and then. Oh. Oh. Blood is just pumping out of its wound. Uh, I thought it was going to kill you. Uh, Gavin is very scared of horse. Horse almost squish him. Gavin very small, horse very big. So I have to protect Gavin from scary horse. But I like horses, but this horse not puppy. No. Big, mean, scary horse that tried to squish Gavin. I mean, that, that horse was a Hell Knight horse. So obviously I need to study up on Hell Knight horses and what they like. Didn't know it. I thought, you know what? It's a normal horse. Turns out Hell Knight horse. It comes from hell. <laughs> okay, uh, one of the two of these people need to enunciate horse. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the best part. The, um, I mean, as the owner of a puppy who's becoming a horse, um, I appreciate that clip, so I had to get that one in. But the... Um, I mean, he, he, here's a question that has nothing to do with Curse, um, because you, you obviously have a great group of, of, of players together. What are your tips, Mr. Dukes, and then, you know, Mr. Barrow, if, you, if you've got, you know, any tips on this, or if they ever let you out of your basement, um, you know, we, we don't have peg, you know, you have to keep writing and keep producing Savage Pathfinder. But um, what is what are your tips on how to find the right group of players to play with, like, and, and get that group cohesion? This group was a complete shot in the dark. I knew them all personally, I had only played with one of them. Todd and Amber hadn't played in like 20 years. None of them had played Savage Worlds. None of them had played together. So what? And you decided to film this. Yes. <laughs> and I just got very, very, very lucky because they are awesome. It's a great time every single time we roll those dice. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that might just be it, right? You try and try and try, and sometimes you find the, the right group with the, um, uh, right, right? Yes, Jody is right, Hannibal. I mean, if I get a saddle for him, the, um, he definitely, like, a, a, a kobold or a, a, a half folk, because we can't use the word hobbit, um, the, uh, with two T's, or the three T's, or one T, or two B's. Anyways, the, um, Oh, here's another thing too. So uh, you, there's a lot of chatter. So everybody but me apparently is in the, in the chat and on on camera is going to be at Gen Con this year. So the, the the Jody and Clint are going to be there, and it sounds like Knights of the Smith Dinner Table are going to be there, and then both of you guys. Are, oh, oh no, Mr. Dukes is still deciding, but he lives close enough where he can like he can roll I'll out of bed one day, <laughs> and and you can just like walk down to Gen Con if you want. I mean. Uh... Kind of. I'll probably be there on Saturday. Okay, so yeah, so there's there there will be savaging happening. Yeah, you know. the um. So if you guys don't know, there is a Facebook group that we've set up for. It's called Savages at Gen Con. So if you want to, you know, use that to connect with other folks, like, hey, who wants to go get some, you know. I don't even know what the, all the restaurants that like were fun have like closed because of COVID. I'm not sure which ones opened them back up. Again, I wouldn't be but. surprised if it's just a lot of food trucks. The, the yeah. food trucks are good, though. I had some really good food trucks. Oh, food. There, that was no shade in that comment, yeah. right? Like, I am all... Uh, <laughs> Meet me at the food truck, guys, and we'll have some, you know, in-between snacks. But the... Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's some there's some good stuff going on at Jake, and I'm glad that we're people are, are actually getting back out and that we are, um, you know, we're doing a little more support for Gen Con. The, the cool thing, so totally off topic, but the... Um, just because this is an idea that came to us. So um, we haven't, as Pinnacle, looked at like the Ennies or any of the awards things in a couple years, mostly because you know, we get our fans know us, they can find us. Um, but I, I think I think with some of the projects we've, we, we, we've done in the later part of this year, and then all of just the amazing folks in our, our swag, 
and um, Ace Community and the Media Network folks who can also get some. I mean, they don't have an actual play award yet. They need to. They have a, a blog and a website award. So I don't. But they need an actual play award now. I think that's the yes. next thing we need to push yes. for for the Ennies. And um, but um, there is there is still a week left if you want to be a judge for the Ennies to get your application to be a judge. And it'd be awesome if we had some some judges who knew Savage Worlds existed. So you know we, we had a, a good judge uh, a couple years back, and you know so our products would make it to the second round, so people could actually vote on them. And that's all we ask for is that you know, people get a fair shake at voting on what the best the best is. So uh, if you guys are Savage Worlds fans and you think you could do the job of being a, a, a voter for the Ennies, um, hit up the Ennies. There's one week left. So next Tuesday, I think, the 12th is the deadline. And, uh, and if you do, if you do make it on the ballot, let us know and we will, you know, we'll have a little campaign boosters for like rah, rah, Savage Worlds guys. But the, um, so as long as, as long as we're talking about voting, um, of all of the, the uh, Pathfinder adventure paths, um it doesn't have to be curse even though that's the one we're selling right now it could be any of them um what is your favorite we'll start with mr dukes do you know i'm gonna go with curse i mean uh, donald i had mentioned on a previous stream like a year ago but that was his favorite again I'm not a pathfinder player hadn't heard of it and it's blown my socks off i am kind of are now true <laughs> I would highly suggest anyone, if you've not played it, get into a game of Curse because it's amazing. You start as it's a revenge tale, essentially. Every character, instead of meeting in a tavern, you all have been wronged by this one individual, and that is why you're together. And then it quickly escalates to the entire city. Its survival is on your shoulders. That's like the ultimate hero's journey. That's a pretty good reason for it. Okay, so Mike, you can't answer curse because that one's been taken. Oh, the, um... oh my gosh. Um, you, I mean, you're like, what's your favorite ice cream? The answer is just yes. All of it. Um, That's true. Okay, so Kurt... I gotta be in the mood for butter pecan though. <laughs> I mean, it's fantastic when you're in the mood for, it, but otherwise, it's like really. Um, so curse, I, 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 curse is up there. Right, I won't say it's number one because he said it's number one. Um, so Shackled City has my heart because it's one of the very first ones I ever did. Uh, and, you know, it's one of the campaigns I ran where people still talk about events that happened in it like 15 years later. And as a GM, I think that's like something that always touches your heart when you're able to give people this moment that they still reflect on. Um, Somebody said uh, Wrath of the Righteous, and that is another really good one. Um, I'm personally looking forward to see what you make with Kingmaker. I mean, that's the one, just because you know, there is, there's that whole open sandbox aspect of it. And it's like, you know, as much capturing all, like, what could you do with Savage Worlds if you are, we already have the Fantasy Companion, and then we're going to have, like, a, a Pathfinder, how to do your own sandbox stuff, and all the little like how you create a kingdom and that i that could be a nightmare for you i i can yeah, just no, imagine no pressure but, land hour right no pressure. um no, your I, kickstarters I, are going fantastic man we had four thousand backers on the first one and we're already at 1200 on the second one i don't think you're you're you're, you're not getting axed anytime soon i uh, i do want to jump in though with what mike said and it's one of the things that i i do love uh about curse is they start you out they they give you a way to tie every man that ice cream thing really I, I know we're just gonna talk about ice cream for the wow. last six minutes of the story uh, that's what we do at gen con we get ice cream right mm. so it, it does a really good job of pulling everyone together it gives you a good introductory uh combat uh not even combat scenario right um and you know we tell you in the book even you know for a lot of players this isn't going to feel like it's a big threat or it's a big danger because it's not this is you building camaraderie and then you step out to a city that's figuratively and literally burning. Um, and so it, it just escalates so quickly, but it does it in a way that makes you feel a part of it. Like you're just like all these other people where you come out and you're like, oh God, when did that happen? And like hippogriff riders are collapsing into freaking buildings out of the sky. Um, it's, it's brilliantly done. And then everything about it takes you just another step as you go right and so you go from like getting revenge to trying to stop the resurrection of this you know dragon god and weirdly enough 
it's connected. Like you had to go a couple paths to get there, but it's connected. And it's just so fun to see like where you started and where you end. This one is a gimme. Uh, Jason Nielsen asks, is there any difference between the pies and the original uh, cures? I did the cures thing too. And Donald did. So Donald made the cures mistake on the campaign. So if you want an add on, it's like cures the Crimson Throne, which there's a plague and there's cures. So it's legit. Um, but the this, uh, Michael, I'll, I'll let you answer because this is an easy layup answer. Uh, so, I mean, it's, a, it's an easy layup answer, but it's also kind of a complex answer. Uh, so Damn you, sir. Ga different... Game designers in their nuance. <laughs> uh, there, Just tell there, them it's based on the HD second edition hardcover. It, that. I mean, that's like the very <laughs> vanilla answer. Um, okay, vanilla is a very complex organ. It's a sex organ of a rare exotic plant found only in the rare part of the world with super. I mean, it is not, vanilla is the worst thing to call vanilla. But anyways, what is the complex answer, sir? Now that you so, insist on, on being uh, pedantic, the the anniversary edition that came out was done after a lot more splat books were put out. Uh, first of all, and so it introduced uh, a lot of different nuances in with um, like the different classes. Uh, that didn't exist before, uh, but it also had some encounters and some things that shifted with it. Um, we are doing 100% the hardback anniversary edition. I've also got my Shackled City here, uh, just because, you know, I have it. Um, so it's based off that, but at the same time, there are some people uh, who we can't use uh, the exact classes because they haven't been converted yet, whether it's a shaman or the vigilante. Um, and so what I've done instead is rather than using the base layout for the old book characters, right? I take what Paizo did for like, say the shaman, uh, and use the edges and stuff we have available now to fit that more appropriately. Um, so it's not exactly a copy from that, uh, but it's as close as we can get. Uh, and it is 100%, like I said, based off the, uh, anniversary edition. What's crazy here is I'm like a big hand gesture person and the video cuts off like right here. So I'm like going crazy down here and uh, it's, it's like- You need to be more Italian and bring it up face level. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So that's my answer to that one. Awesome. The, uh, so Mike, um, uh, one of the, we're almost at, at our hour. Um, but so we, we just put your, your fresh link in. It's Vorpalet Productions on YouTube if you guys haven't caught it. They, uh, you have- released you're still in book one on the releases you are yeah, playing through book four there are six total books so if if barbeau gets off his lazy keister and finishes this in enough time after our campaign which ends next thursday um the usual month ish uh, after but this is a big one guys so maybe it's not a month it's not just one book it's like it's a lot of books um uh, to you know. to be clear uh it's layout stuff <laughs> That's what okay, I'm doing. Simon. Yeah, we, uh, Simon's on vacation. He's not watching his stream, so we'll just we'll just throw him under the the lorry or the double decker. Is that what they have over in? in yeah. No. No. There's uh, you know minor tweaks from feedback and uh, encounters, uh, but other than that, it's mostly like trying to make sure all the images fit right. Because uh, the the good and the bad with with using Paizo is a we get to use a lot of their a, a lot of their great art. Right, like I love a lot of the the artwork they have. It's all fantastic, mm -hmm. yes. but we also have to make it fit within the page layout. And so I do my best to make sure, like when you have the picture for a Glabrazu demon, for example, um, it's on the page with that information, and you're not like two pages later or something like that. And so it comes down to trying to to make that all fit right in the layout. And there's a lot more to that than I originally thought. Uh, she's not wrong. Um, <laughs> but, but are we both wearing pants? Because other, you know, you can't tell. You know, on the off chance I had to stand up, I may try. <laughs> um, but yeah, so a lot of credit to, to Simon a lot of the way layout work he does because there is a lot that goes into it. Um, and it then is. you know everybody who does like I think it's Carl who does the background still the the, the trade dressings. Um, a lot of work goes into that, and so uh, it's not a sit down for five minutes and just throw stuff somewhere. Uh, you want to make it look nice. Yeah, no, it's hard. It is hard seeing like the just 
you know, oh, we have a quarter page blank spot in this chapter that we just can't fill with, you know, you know all those little stuff like that. And, and then, of course, there's the bindings, which are the hardest things to do, because when they send you the proofs, those really aren't there. There's just like the cover and the back cover. And um, so, yeah, you know, Simon took a little heat this last time as a couple of the pictures and the, the title were it's just quarter inch off either way. Either. The um, that's OK. We'll never make that mistake again. But the um, so, so everyone who's joined us, the uh, we are we've got a Curse of the Crimson Throne Kickstarter with the advanced players guide for Pathfinder for Savage Worlds. It is on Kickstarter right now. It is funded. Um, you Talk guys. Right. There's over twelve hundred backers, which is amazing. Um the, and that's the, thing, that's the thing we really appreciate. And we've got nine more days. It finishes next Thursday. The um, We have 1,201. See, just while I was speaking, another person back. That's it's the magic of, of like streaming television. Whoever that is, you're my favorite person for the next five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> the, um, uh, oh, and then poor, poor, poor BH just canceled their pledge. But someone else, okay. See, don't, don't lower our numbers when I'm on stream, guys. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's serious. But the uh, no, we don't really watch it all that seriously. We 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 like seeing you guys. That you know, that you you you've supported this project so successfully so far. I mean, the, the original Kickstarter was great. We're so glad you guys have those books. The uh, Mr. Dukes, we really are excited to see what you guys do in your group when you actually get your hands on Mr. Barbeau's Looking translation. The um, we'll, we'll get some we'll get some dragons. You can and throw then, my cinder maw at him. <laughs> <laughs> He's very friendly. Hugs, uh -huh. not drugs. <laughs> <laughs> So, and the other cool thing is like, so Gen Con's coming up. So the, if, if you're a, if you are a wild card and want to meet up with the other Savage Worlds lovers around, um, there is a Facebook group, Sav uh, something like Savage Worlds of Gen Con, I think is what it's called. Um, just look at, look for it on Facebook and the, um, the meet up because uh, there's going to be an epic uh, ice cream tasting. I'm pretty sure it's going to be Clinton, Jody and Mike and Mike and um the, the, the dinner smith table guys are in chat and uh, maybe scott maybe scott will go the um i won't be there this year but the um yeah next year will be even more ice cream and we'll have to do that but the um so guys you know, thank you for backing the campaign it's been a really great ride so far check out mr duke's vorpal edge productions uh for the uh actual play and so you many more episodes to come because you're only in book one and there are six oh, books yeah. Um, also tonight we're going to do a, a go do a raid. Um, it is the premiere of um, uh, uh, Valor Studios' Axion, and um, which is really awesome because Cheyenne Wright and a lot of our our stream friends like I, I have to take credit for Candice. Uh, I was the first one who, who hired her to be on stream, and um, now she's got a whole stream career. So the um, go check out Candice and then Megan Caves Callerman and um, Cheyenne and then oh Taylor Von Biljohn. She's a great. She was in our um, Flash Gordon stream. Um, the whole cast is great, and they are doing it right now. So let me hop over to Twitch, and then um, it feels like the uh, credits in a Marvel movie where it's like I, thanks to, and then it's just ten minutes right? of all the people we want to thank. Uh, it is true. There are. I mean, that's kind of why I think I want to. We we got to get a Savage Worlds fun person um, on the Ennies because there's just so much going on in our our awesome community. Oh, also this week while I'm setting up the raid. The um, we have the on Thursday uh, at the same bat time, same bat channel, so like 8 p.m. Eastern. We are doing the Savage Worlds Summer Showcase, and um, this week on the showcase, uh, let me go pull up who is on this week. We have got um, James Jim Davenport, and he's going to be releasing. Uh, he's an ace with Black Dog Squad and Bad Actors, which looks like a little like Three Kings kind of you know U.S. troopers. Um, in a Sandy Sandy Kingdom. We've got Manuel Sams all the way from Germany talking about Spar Honors. And then we're going to have Cheyenne Wright and Dice Barbarian from Valor Studios, who are, we're going to go raid them right now, talking about Axion and the other shows they produce. So it should be a, uh, a good time on Thursday at 8 p.m. And then if you are a Savage Worlds ace, uh, licensee, swag person, or media network folks, um, get in touch with me at info at pegging .com, and we will have you on the summer showcase. We want you guys to show off all the wonderful things you guys are doing with Savage Worlds. And I think momentarily I'm going to type in slash raid and we're going to go to Velour Studios. Oh, no, not YouTube. This is what we get for copying and pasting live. And uh, let's see, it's V L O R E S T U D I O S and see if it works. Yes. 
The channel is intended for mature audiences. That's okay. Can't we raid mature audiences? Okay, so if not, let me let me get the link in there. Because if we can't raid mature audiences, then it is twitch.tv slash Valore, V-A-L-O-R-E, studios, S-T-U-D-I-O-S. I'm going to put that in the comments right now, just so you guys can go over there. Because this show is done. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you guys for coming. Jody is right. Sword's out. And I'm going to see if we can't get actually get the raid going. And, um... It's okay. Just make it happen. Oh, we have a raid in progress. Okay, here we go. So, guys, we're doing the raid, and that's it. I'm going to hit raid now. Awesome. Catch you guys later. It's been fun. We'll see you on Thursday. Bye, guys.